Um, and I'm going to go through some scriptures kind of quickly, and then I'll, like last week, park on a couple that I, I'll, I'll get to talking about. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. You know, it's hard to actually wait for all the pages to flip up here. But I do know what it's like to be in there waiting. And, in the, in the, you know, you, you can't find it before the guy's over. So I'll try to give you time, if that's all right. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who, cur who curse you, and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Not it, doesn't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect." It's plain to see in here, and you know, it's interesting how we, anyone in here could get some scriptures together and come up here, and, and, and for, but for some reason, God has designed a system of, you know, um, of church. So I, why I'm the one up here reading scriptures, I don't know, but, uh, so I don't assume any, that anybody doesn't know what any of this means, but you know, there is something about this system that God has set up for us to get in and just have focus, a time of focus on the Word, which you should all have in your own time. But, uh, you know, I, we know what that's saying. It's, it's easy to love your, those who do good to you, or it even says easy to love your brethren, which most of us may not even feel like that's very easy. So if we're not even to that level, you know, let's push through that level and get to the, to the level of loving those who have spitefully used us. Which um, we've all had that, and then that's where I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna jump through all these and go on to, to Proverbs. This is really what's at the heart of where I'm at. Uh, Proverbs fifteen thirteen is the first one. Love those who spitefully use you. We talked about last week, it says love is, is not, you don't love in hypocrisy, and you, you don't love in word, but in action and in deed, which means that it, it is, requires uh, effort on our parts to love. It's not just something that we, it's not this fluffy concept that we talk about in church. Or, you know, part of the, the 60s movement, which I'm not, you know, I, <laughs> I wasn't there, but I, uh, like many others, embraced the culture uh, as far as whether it be music or whatever, just the whole, wow, that's cool, the 60s. And, but it, it's interesting how, um, you know, the love was, love was kind of love, you know. And, and that was in direct response to a lot of things. Uh, you know, there was a lot of war going on. But, but we have this concept of love, and it's a word that's thrown around. But we need to grasp and get into the biblical meaning of it and ask God to re, to, to, conform our hearts to the proper kind of love, his kind of love, because obviously that kind of love did not persevere and shine through and do many people any good. It may have felt good at the time, but it, but it, didn't, um, it didn't change anything. But, but God's love, God is love, it does change things, and it will change things in our lives and in our community and, and on the, the planet. Proverbs fifteen thirteen says, A mer merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Wow. A merry heart makes for a, a cheerful countenance, a skip in your step, a smile on your face. You know, when you, when you can say to somebody in your heart, when you, when you see them, I love you, you don't have to tell them the words, but, but they read it on your face. It's in your countenance. A merry heart uh, makes for a good countenance. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Wow. We've all been there. Let's go to Proverbs 17, 22. And keep that one in mind. I've got four, um, or three Proverbs here. Proverbs 17, 22. It says, A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. 
you know, a merry heart does good like medicine. We've heard laughter does good like medicine. A merry heart. You got love in your heart, merry heart, you're happy. It's like medicine. And in direct contrast, it says a broken spirit dries the bones. I mean, that even denotes physical problems that can come along with a broken heart. And we all know that, you know, through science and the word, and everything confirms that uh, a broken heart, a broken spirit uh, affects you physically. But on the other end of things, a merry heart does good like medicine. Proverbs 18:14 which is just a chapter away. It says, The spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness. Well, there's another indication that you, the, the, uh, the condition of your spirit will sustain you in sickness. But who can bear a broken spirit? Who can bear a broken spirit? And those scriptures and Proverbs really kind of are at the, at the, at the core of what... I've got some other scriptures here... Um, but those three, you know, a broken heart is what's on my mind. And maybe it's from listening to a lot of Elvis lately. I don't know, Heartbreak Hotel, you know, <laughs> which I have been, so I'm not kidding. But that's not why. Um, it's just a broken heart. Every one of us, you know, to love like a child, to love like God says to love. It even says it indicates the faith of a child. What about the love of a child? We all know the love of a child. Unconditional. Just, I mean, you, you know, you can get a little over angry with your child and, and maybe punish more than what you think. Or, or you're in a bad mood and they're wanting to play and you're like, get out of my face. And, oh, they just love you. They just bounce right back. And uh, we all have had that love at one time. And, and it really, you know, it's... Even as a young kid in, in a junior high or something, what they call puppy love, you know, and we all kind of uh, um, somehow make that sound inferior, like puppy love. But I, I, I believe that what that is is an actually uh, uh, not an inferior love, but a superior love that you have, that all of us had at one point from birth on, and whether it be the day you got out of the womb or as a six-year-old, or as an eight-year-old, or as a 10-year-old, or as a 20-year-old, somewhere along the line, every one of us has hit that brick wall in life where, whoa, it's a cruel world, you know? Um, it could be uh, parents divorcing. It could be abuse as a child. It could be the first girl that breaks up with you and breaks your heart in junior high. Uh, it could be anything in life. And, it, and once it happens after that first time, you start building that wall, and it starts, ha and it'll happen again, but maybe not as bad because you back off, and we can close. And next thing you know, we're all these people that don't want to touch shoulders in public because we've been hurt. You know, we've we've been hurt. And the thing is, is that's that's the devil's. That's a huge, huge tool, and and that's what these uh, scriptures talk about. Uh, a merry heart is like medicine. You know why we're sick? Is we don't have merry hearts, and not us but just the, the, the planet and even the body of Christ at large because, uh, I mean, Oprah Winfrey has made millions off of exploiting the people that have had broken hearts and helping them in some ways. I don't know sometimes if exposing it by itself helps it if you don't have the proper cure, but the thing is, is every one of us, every one of us has had a broken heart. And it doesn't matter to what degree, whether it be uh, ripped in half and thrown on the ground or you just have a little wound. You know, but either way, it's, we've all started somewhere and probably everyone in this room has had, even if you even remember it, because it could have happened as childhood, you've had your, you've, you've been broken hearted. And, uh, But you know what? Psalms 147.3, which I'll turn there. I mean, that's the fact of it. But you know what? I wouldn't say all that if there wasn't a good side to, to, to that. You know, just we're not going to have a pity party here because we've all been brokenhearted and have been and still are, most of us. It still burns in there. And some of you don't even know why you flare up over something. You know, you hear some, you watch some movie and, you know, there's these, these, these triggers. You know, you, you drive through a, a town you used to live in or you see a certain type of car or you hear somebody's name and whether you remember it or not, and most of the time we, we do, unfortunately, or, or sometimes we really suppress things, but Boy, I mean, it can, broken hearts can eat at you the whole, your whole life. But Psalms 147, 147.3. You know, it starts, at, actually 147, it says, Praise the Lord, 
for it is good to sing praises to our God. You know, there's a reason we come to, to church and, and praise and worship. Don't just think it's, hey, I can't wait to go to church and hear Robbie's awesome guitar licks. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm teasing. Because you know what? Nobody hears me play more than me. Every time I pick up a guitar, I hear me play. I mean, it would be like listening to nothing but like one record your whole life. I mean, I can't stand to hear me play. So, but that's good. That's a drive we all have as, as musicians or anybody of any trade to get better because you always want to, you know, impress yourself. <laughs> but anyway, praise the Lord for it is good to sing praises our God for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. Wow. Praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. And it says here, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. You know, that's God's heart right there. He heals. That's the first thing he said here. And it's interesting. He associates it with praise and worship. You want to get healed? Well, there's a clue right there as, as to what to do. And there's praise and worship. It's, it says it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's beautiful to God. But why is it beautiful to God? Well, it's probably beautiful to God for a complex uh, layered reasons that we don't understand, but I believe it's beautiful to God because it opens the door for him to come in and do what he says he's going to do, and that's heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. And, uh, and Jesus, in Luke 4, 18... Luke 4, 18... And I can just feel, I know that anybody with any kind of, oh, yes, openness, when you talk about being brokenhearted, when you, you talk about these things, there's a huge, oh, boy, I'd love to just eradicate that. If I can't for, forget the, the memory, if I can't get rid of the memory, at least I can get rid of the, uh, the feeling that goes with it, something, you know. And uh, everybody, everybody, and it could be at all kinds of levels. Um, and you may not even know how big a stuff there is in you until you, until you get further. God does spiritual surgery on us. And most of the time in my experience, which you may not have seen me up here a lot, but you know, I was raised in church, which is not everything. Sometimes it can be detrimental because you get church wise and you know what to say. Um, but uh, I've seen a lot of spiritual surgery done in praise and worship. Praise and worship is important. And that's why God would want to keep you from opening up. And, you know, you don't have to raise your hands. Um, I'm kind of a stiff person, you know, you got, if anybody knows me, they notice that. You know, me and, me and Rich, we get along good together, we're kind of like, just leave me alone, I'm going to, you know. <laughs> but um, I remember one time thinking, you know, I'm, I need to get over myself. I, you know, I'll raise my hands and praise the Lord. Nobody's watching, I just feel like that some, for some reason, I'm, you know, the insecurity of everybody's watching me or something. It's like nobody cares what I'm doing. This is ridiculous, I mean, that's just kind of cocky for me to think that, anybody cares what I'm doing so you know I did it and it was like well that didn't you know feel that different you know but I but it was cool I was glad I was glad that I did it so after church oh I won't name names but I had a couple women elders in the church oh Robbie I just saw the chains break <laughs> me and your mom been praying for this for years and at that moment I realized you know what some people are watching. <laughs> so, but the thing is, is whatever comfort zone that you're at, whatever level you need to get out of in praise and worship, but you know what? I like playing on the worship team. When I'm out here, I'm antsy. I want to play. That's, to me, a way of singing. I said, I don't have a good singing voice, and I, I know it. I mean, I have a good enough ear from enjoying music to know that I sing out of pitch. I, I, I don't have the control in my voice to find that pitch. Sometimes I'll, there's a certain song that I'll have sang to enough times, and I'm chasing a rabbit here. But anyway, I, I just, my point is this, is you can find your way to praise and worship. And yes, you know, don't be bound by, you know, well, we have to raise our hands because the guy, the, this, have you ever noticed in song people are clapping and all of a sudden there's a verse in a song that says raise your hands and everybody starts raising their hands? That's fine. That's, a, that's why they have that in the song. But, you know, let's not, you know, if you want to, however you want to do it, you all know what the level is. But, and uh, this, I don't have any scripture for this other than this one in Psalms, uh, which was what we're talking about, the, the, the brokenhearted. Uh, praise and worship is a key element to that. And uh, 
anyway, I, I remember being brokenhearted once, and it was the only time in my life, or the first time in my life I prayed, and I was in the dark in the middle of a, in a, in the middle of a trailer, and I remember singing a, oh gosh, what was it? I lift my voice to worship you, O Lord, O my soul rejoice, whatever. Some song I knew that I thought was cool, and cried and sang it. But you know what? I truly believe, looking back now, that was a, a focal point of, of, you know, towards a step in my getting over that. So praise and worship is important. Luke 4.18 says this. This is Jesus. Okay, he'd just gotten tempted in the wilderness. So this is kind of his first, in Luke, his first kind of... Uh, He'd been anointed. He got, you know, he uh, baptized. The spirit landed on him like a dove. He went out in the wilderness 40 days, got tempted, and he walked out. And he was all strengthened. He, he'd been anointed, tempted, and he was out ready to, to start his ministry. And he went to the, uh, the tabernacle. Is that correct, Robbie? Tabernacle? Or he went to church. <laughs> and he grabbed the scroll and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. You know, he has anointed him. Why? I mean, this is, he came. This was his pro, pro, proclamation. In Isaiah 61.1, that is, he was quoting out of Isaiah, which was a prophecy of Isaiah, the, the messianic prophet speaking uh, the words of Jesus before Jesus had ever uh, come as a man, and, and this was the beginning of stirring up the uh, Sadducees and Pharisees, and you know that was real sad, you see. <laughs> but the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach uh, the gospel to the poor, and He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And the point is this: this. He sent him for a purpose. This whole thing right here, which it says in, in John, that the, the, he was the word become flesh. There's a purpose to this. There's a reason this was written. There's a reason that it became uh, manifest as flesh on the earth. You know, you can talk about the story of glory. That is it. But there's a purpose, and the heart of God is to, to come and heal the brokenhearted. And there's other things he listed there, but this is what we're talking about tonight. He came to heal the brokenhearted. So if you're brokenhearted, when we talked about, oh, brokenhearted, and everybody, oh, you know, that's why Oprah makes millions off of it, because everybody is like, oh, you mean there's somebody else that went through something somewhat similar to what I went through? I got to watch this. How did they get through this? And, and what she does is fine. But I tell you what, there is a more permanent, less flamboyant way of getting healed than to have to stare at a box in a coma-like state watching, you know, making somebody millions of dollars. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm just saying that Jesus, that is his purpose. And I can't, you know, there's a, a, a lot of scriptures that we could talk about, but the, the bottom line is this. Between praising and worshiping and getting into this and getting to know Jesus and just believing that he was sent for a reason, to heal the brokenhearted, every one of us, me included, I don't know anybody that doesn't qualify I mean, that's why he was sent. Don't you think that God knows what a mass remedy needed to be put on the earth for mankind as, as to heal the brokenhearted? Because the thing is this, um, you don't have to be brokenhearted. You can get back to that state of unconditional love and that, that maybe some of us are closer to than we used to be or closer to than others are. It's not a comparison. It's not, well, I love more than so-and-so, because actually that's, at that point, that's not love because you're being haughty and puffed up. Uh, but uh, we can get back to that state, that state of that, you know, um, when you're a kid and, and you, just, you just love. I mean, you're just, you just love. I mean, almost... And I don't like to say this because it, 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 uh, it makes you think that it's some kind of a dull mental act. But like Forrest Gump, you know, it's just like, hey, whatever. Oh, that guy cussed me out. Oh, he must be having a bad day. Oh, well, you know, stupid is, stupid does. You know, I mean, it just rolls off your back and you get back to a state. And I tell you what, every one of your relationships, uh, beginning with your spouse and your children and everything else, uh, will be in hand, and to God, especially. That's what we talked last week. The number one commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And to do that, we need to have our broken hearts healed. And not everybody wants to admit they had a broken heart because, um, 
To admit it means you think about it, which means you feel it, which means you go back there again. But you don't have to do that. You know, to be honest, I don't know the exact, because I haven't been there. I can't say, well, I'm a model of this. I've got a testimony. I have forgiven everybody, you know, I want to. But it starts, it starts with loving your enemy and those who spitefully use you, the scripture we read. Get in here, pray for somebody. Save somebody's name that you just, I mean, you'd almost, the, the only person that if, if there was like one day that God said, hey, anarchy is for today, I'll let everybody just run rampant for one day, get it out of your system, and that one person that you'd go kill, you need to get in here and pray for, you know? And if you say their name, get the Ephesians prayer. Ephesians, um, uh, you know, Father, I pray that, uh, you know, that the, your love for so-and-so uh, is, is uh, they have a revelation of your love for them so they can fulfill your, your calling in their life. Whatever your prayer is for yourself, pray and use that name. Oh, it kind of hurts. But you know what? Then pray the next morning. Oh, it kind of hurts. Well, not as bad. And over time, you're going to be crying, actually praying for that person and realizing that, wow, I, you know, that you're, yeah, that you're set free. Um, I don't know. I tell you what, I challenge people to get in the Word and find out exactly how it works for you. But it's here that you're going to find it. What you can do to, uh, to uh, take advantage of what God did by sending Jesus for the purpose of healing the brokenhearted. I mean, this isn't just so we can come here and get to know one another and have some kind of st status quo church atmosphere. Um, there's a purpose. And uh, anyway... Let me see what kind of um, scriptures I have here that I hadn't. Um, well, let's go to, this is kind of, well, let's go to Ephesians 4, 30 to 32. And just like last week, I'll say this again, when, the, when you know, my parents are in Israel, so when the cat's away, the mice won't play but they will get out of church earlier. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 30 through 32. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I've heard that term my whole life. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And I never really knew what that meant. As a kid, it means talking on the back row during the, you know, the run around the church moments. Um, I don't know, but I'll tell you what, right here, it, it kind of lets you in on what grieving the Holy Spirit means. It says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Boy, I said a lot of scriptures last week about loving one another, forgiving. Actually, in my mind tonight was forgiveness or bitterness. You know, that whole, that train of thought of bitterness, forgiveness, uh, and it turned into the brokenhearted aspect. But that's just it. Mo you can't think, oh, I'm a victim, I'm brokenhearted. I, you know, you need to take, don't be reactive, be proactive. Say, no, I'm brokenhearted and I don't, I'm not going to put up with this because Jesus came so that I might have life more abundantly, so I don't have to be brokenhearted. And by gosh, I'm going to pray, I'm going to read, I'm going to praise and worship, I'm going to do whatever I can because I know he'll meet me the rest of the way. And just as we know in faith that just because that next day, you, you know, or the two days later or, or a month later or a year later, you, ha you have a relapse, it could be uh, Jenny Crowell, Ray and Jenny Crowell are not here this week because her brother uh, passed away at 3 o'clock in the morning two days ago. Um, and as you can all imagine, I imagine she's upset. I don't know anything about, I don't know how old her brother was. I, I don't know a lot of the details, but you don't need to know. I mean, her, her brother passed away. And, and so you can, you can remember them in prayer. But there's another, she's brokenhearted. You know, there's a healing. It doesn't always have to be whatever you're thinking in your mind happened to you. I mean, there's so many scenarios for brokenheartedness. And uh, that's why, I mean, that's a huge purpose why Jesus was, was sent. And I may sound like I just keep saying the same thing, but you know what? I, 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 would. I would. I would talk on this until we were all a huge testimony and had that merry heart that doeth like medicine. I mean, you want to you wanna not have sickness in your body? Pursue this love stuff and the, the non-brokered heart stuff. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, a huge, huge deal. It says tender heart is forgiving one another, which this goes... Um, you know, I'd like to go back to last week to 
Well, no, we'll go to this story. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. And I may read the whole thing. I probably will. It's not real long, but uh, probably be the last, last thing I do. And my dad will be back next Wednesday night. So he told me on the phone, uh, he called me. He said, how are things going? I said, well, this was Thursday. How are things going? I said, real good. Don't worry about anything. Things are going really good. Uh, you know, what did you speak on last night? I said, I did love, and it was okay. He said, great. He said, great. When, well, I tell you what, when I get back, I mean, you, you, I'll give you as many Wednesday nights as you want. I, I, said, I said, well, Dad, you already have. <laughs> I don't want any more. No, I'm kidding. It's, it's all good. But, you know, it's still different, you know, being on the, on the other end of things. But anyway, uh, Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant, therefore, fell down before him. Now, there's a key point there. Uh, the servant fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. He forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat. And that doesn't mean he was having a uh, charismatic service. It means he was beating on him. And took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. Remember, love is patient. And this guy is saying, Love me. Love me, and I'll pay you. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when the fellow servants saw that what he had done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said unto him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the tortures until he should pay all that was due to him. And this is Jesus talking. He said, So my heavenly Father will also do to you, each of you from his, his heart does not if from his heart does not forgive his brethren his trespass. Once again, that's pretty plain uh, uh, parable of, of how it is. But, you know, these, um, you got to forgive is, is part of this healing process. It's not something you cry out for. You have to, it's, you have to be proactive. You have to say, I'm going to forgive. Um, now, notice in this passage, it does, it, both servants... Both servants begged and asked for forgiveness. These weren't people that were just running with the money, evil, no, you know, do no good or type people. They begged, and and they so which opened the door, the opportunity, which you forgive either way, but you know, uh, but they 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 forgave. They 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 asked for forgiveness, and the 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 master not only forgave, and he didn't say, "Well, pay me when you can." He cleared all the debt, which you know that's God in this example. And there's many passages that say, if you don't forgive others, then, um, then God won't forgive you. So it's, that's, that's pretty important. I, I want to be forgiven of what I've done. And, and judge not that, you not that you be not judged, as Matthew 7, 1 through 5. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with me measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me re remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite. She says, don't love with hypocrisy, is what we saw last week. It says, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your other's eye. And I said this last week, and I just, I just, ugh, I, I, I'm believing it strongly, just, and it's not condonement of sin. It's mind your own business. Pray for people. If you care and pray, don't chatterbox about about it, and because and, and, when, we, when we said the, the list of things that were 
uh, sin. I mean, there's a lot. We're all in the, in the flesh. You know, our spirits cannot sin, but our flesh will sin. And uh, I think it's, to me, it's extremely clear. Now, there's scriptures that I didn't bring up that says if there's a brother that's out, you know, um, I, don't, I don't remember exactly how it's put, but it says you don't even eat, have dinner with him. You know, but we're talking about the, not the people begging and saying, I'm a brother, you know, forgive me. This is, this is people that just, we had a, a person that went to church here that was a, a Messianic Jew and worked in a position in the church. Great guy. And one day he decided to denounce Christ. He didn't believe in Christ anymore. You know, he said, I don't, I'm going full out with my Jewish heritage. And, uh, you know, things like that, or, or people that, uh, you know, you know, that what my dad always says, you know, you know when you just need to stay away from somebody because it, it's, there's infection there and you don't want to be around it. You can pray for them or whatever, but you don't want to be around it. But you also know when, when it's a brother and, it, and, and it says, you know, in Galatians 6 we read last week, if any, if any one of you be uh, uh, found in a, a trespass, then, then restore such a one in a, in a manner of, in a, in a spirit of gentleness. And it said, lest for your own sake, lest you open the door for attacks in your own life. You know, um, it's pretty serious stuff. But the thing is, is it, it is a, uh, a pursuit. Uh, there, there's a strong reason to get into the Word um, for God's glory. But even, it's okay to have motivation for your own self to be healed of a broken heart or, or whatever, to be healed of finances, you know, to be healed of whatever. But, you know, specifically tonight on the love walk, and I don't know, I was not, last week I had everything, I mean, as soon as I said it, it came up, and I was prepared this week, I was like, you know, I, I didn't know. But I got these, these, these words in Proverbs, I tell you, the, the core of what I knew what I was going to talk tonight is the, the Proverbs where it says, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but the sorrow of the heart uh, the, the spirit is broken and a merry heart does good like medicine but a broken spirit dries the bones and the spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness but who can bear a broken spirit I mean, this is what Solomon was saying who can bear a broken spirit who can well I tell you we don't have to because Jesus came to heal the broken hearted and that be in our flesh in our heart that be every one of us to some degree and you know what it's, in, it's infectious you know, you get your heart healed and you, you discover what it is, what scripture it is, or what you get into praise and worship a little more and not be looking around or thinking it's too loud or too soft or, you know, why do they play the same song over and over? Or, you know, you get into praise and worship at a greater level. You get into the word at a greater level. You have a breakthrough and all of a sudden you got the countenance and a skip in your step. Well, you know what? It's going gonna, it's gonna to pass around and all of a sudden you're, you're going to guard yourself. You know, somebody comes up and says, well, so-and-so, they weren't here again this week. I bet you they're drinking again. Oh, you know, you'll say, hey, I don't want to hear that. You know what? They're a brother in Christ, and, and if you don't want to pray about them with me, then I don't want to hear it, you know, because I love you and I love them, and I want us all to have a spirit of love that, that, you know, in this church and in, in our lives. So um, it, it is an action, you know, and like uh, Heartland Coates said, it's work. You know, we're not... We're not justified by works, but we're not, you know, but we're also not um, unaccountable for works. You know, we got to work. We got to, we got to work at this and, and, and get better. I know I do, and I can't speak for you all, but I can just only imagine. Anyway, oh, I'm 10 minutes late. It's 8.10. Okay. Well, you know what? I, uh. I will end with prayer, and um, I know sometimes we have, if you're, if you're not saved, if you're not a Christian, or you're not sure, you, or you want to be sure, um, Rob, Elder, Elder Rob, which always makes me think of that ELO song, Elder Robbo, or is that Eagles? <laughs> Elder Rob. <laughs> We'll uh, be up here, and if you want to be a Christian, anybody here that isn't, and, and, and there's a lot of ways to do this, but if you're not and you want to be, he can and assure you and pray with you to make sure that you are. Otherwise, um, we're not going to have, 
you know, if you want to have prayer with Rob, that's fine. But I just challenge everybody to, to, to not take the standard charismatic, I'm going to go get prayed for and go home and it's all taken care of route. I challenge you to do, and, and there, that is a good way. That is a good way. There's something about contact and collective prayer. But I, I challenge you to go home and, and, and think about getting in the Word on your own. Think about praying with your spouse. Think about praying with your kids. Think about praying it by yourself. And think about uh, praising and worshiping outside of the church. You know, I mean, there should be more homework than, than there is in the church. I'm talking about me. So I, I leave you not with a, you know, a big, you know, sweaty, whoo, I can feel it coming on. Everybody come forward. You know, if that came on me, that would be cool because I don't know exactly what that's like. But, I, but I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to challenge you to go home and, 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 and do something about it between you and God and you and your brothers and sisters. And it, but if you, do want, if you do have prayer, that is okay. That is A, available, especially if you want to become a Christian with, with Elder Rob here. And um, I don't know if Eric can uh, get me some music or Alice. Can you? Is that okay? Just to make it seem somewhat churchy. <laughs> but you know what? When I, and I may have said this last week, when, when, when I started the, the music thing up here a little bit, I, I was, my motive was to help my dad out. You know, I really didn't know what I was doing, and I still kind of don't, but, um, but I knew I wanted to help my dad out. That was for sure. And I had a chance to talk to Pastor Keith Moore about music, and I said, you know, hey, wow, it's amazing that, that um, you called. I, I just, you know, started with the music at my dad's church. Can you give me any pointers? And he said, well, you know, when I was studying that stuff or when I was starting out with Pastor Hagen, um, God spoke to me and said, Keith, if you're not enjoying it, what makes you think I am? And boy, that, I don't know. And then after that, he said, and after that, I can't tell you what to do because you gotta, it's got to be specific to your church. So as a member of the church, I say, one, have fun. Have fun with it. And two, well, let's not compare ourselves to other churches and think, well, wait a minute, you know, just let's have fun and let's be this body, this part of the body. And, and if, and if, and if you if you're coexist with other parts and overlap, you know, that's great. Enjoy that. And uh, it's kind of like restaurants. God gave us a lot of places to eat. You know, if you don't like, you know, the Italian restaurant, you can go over to the Mexican restaurant or you can go to McDonald's. You know, he's given us plenty of places to eat up his word. So, but anyway, for you guys that are locked in here, I enjoy, like, having dinner with you tonight. <laughs>